Technology has transformed the global media landscape, especially the news media, as content creators of every ilk and genre have taken advantage of the digital revolution, commoditizing content, and forever blurring the lines between e-commerce and content, news and entertainment, information and disinformation. Hello, everyone. I'm Chitra Raghavan, and this is Techtopia. One media executive who saw the digital revolution coming long before others did is journalist, media investor, and advisor, Marcus Broccoli. He's here to talk with us today about the future of digital media and news. Broccoli is co-founder of North Base Media, an investment firm specializing in media and technology in global growth markets. He has served as an advisor to media groups, including Graham Holdings, Univision, and HT Media. Before co-founding North Base Media, Broccoli was executive editor of the Washington Post, overseeing the Post's print and digital news operations, shepherding the newspaper's digital revolution, and helping the Post win seven Pulitzer Prizes. Before joining the Post, Broccoli was managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. His more than two-decade tenure at the Journal included 15 years as a foreign correspondent, mainly in Asia, and eight years as a senior editor in New York. Marcus, welcome to Techtopia. Thank you so much, Chitra. Great to be here. So we were both reporters at major news outlets when the digital revolution began and the end of what you aptly described the other day when we were chatting as the voice end of the voice of God period when journalists were highly trained, experienced, reputable for the most part, right? Respected quite a bit and the main content creators in media and news media. And then you saw the digital tsunami hit and it changed all of our lives. And you were on the forefront of bringing the Washington Post into the digital age. It must've been a huge challenge to put it, pull it off. What was it like? Well, the truth is, you know, the, the transformation that began with digital technologies, uh, which really led to what, you're, what you were describing, the end of the voice of God, the end of the gatekeeper era, it actually began, you know, probably 10 or 15 years before I came to the Washington Post in 2008, the internet began to sort of erode at the edges, the ability of, of the big centralized sort of monopoly oligopoly media players, um, the ability of them to set the agenda for all other news coverage, because it opened up the door to other people creating content and distributing content via social media channels, um, via startup media companies uh, early in the early days via blogs, allowing people to sort of connect with audiences in a way that previously hadn't been possible. And it took a long time for the big established media companies to recognize this tsunami of change that was bearing down on them. Uh, it just, it, it kind of, for a long time, it simmered and percolated along. And the big focus was on whether, you know, the, the, digital revolution was going to you know, erode as it did. The classified ad business was going to take away as it did the display advertising business. Um, and it wasn't so much on how content itself would have the ability of, of anybody to create content and share content and create groups to share content, how that would erode the credibility and the authority of traditional media houses. And that that really, you know, it came slowly. You know, the Washington Post, where I was the executive editor from 2008 until the end of 2012, the Washington Post actually was very early into digital media. Um, they were one of the first organizations to put the Washington Post, to put their newspaper online. Um, the Washington Post company at that time owned both the Washington Post and Newsweek. And the then owner of the Washington Post, uh, Don Graham, who was the chairman of the Washington Post company, made a, a very astute decision early on to put all the digital media operations of not only the Washington Post, but Newsweek into a separate building in, frankly, a separate state. It was actually in Virginia, a different legal jurisdiction from the Washington Post or Newsweek, because he was concerned at the beginning that all these digital media companies would be, would be suffocated by the the rhythms and obsessions of print journalists who weren't at all focused on the much more dynamic needs of the digital media properties. So by the time I got there in 2008, actually the Washington Post had been doing a lot of innovative and strong digital content for years, but it wasn't integrated into the Washington Post newspaper. They, they sort of coexisted. And I, I remember when I came to the Washington Post as editor in the summer of 2008, 
an early meeting in my time there was ahead of the Republican convention in 2008. And the editor of the Washington Post online site, Jim Brady, came into the print side newsroom in downtown Washington to ask whether the, the editors of the print side during the Republican convention could be, could be sure to send over stories as soon as they were ready, uh, instead of waiting until the end of the of the print uh, of the print editions reporting and editing cycle at the end of the day to send them over and the print side editors basically told him you know we can't do that we have a process and we'll send all that stuff to you when it's finished editing probably sometime between 7 and 11 p.m which of course is not exactly when people are looking to to find content online yeah interesting uh a new york times story that wrote about your transformation of the post newsroom and sort of bringing metrics into the whole game in addition to obviously keeping an eye on the quality of the journalism, kind of marrying those those two together, described your efforts as one of the most sweeping and closely watched reorientations of any newsroom in the country and 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 talked about this emphasis on metrics uh, along with quality journalism. And, and that's keeping metrics front and center is kind of a given now, right? It's something we automatically do, but I'm sure at that time, it must have come as a surprise to some in the newsroom and potentially at some personal cost to you in terms of your own uh, popularity at the Post as you were trying to turn that big ship around in some ways. When I came to the Post in 2008, I was incredibly fortunate to have both inherited a team of of incredibly talented, digitally minded people who came from within that Washington Post Newsweek Interactive organization that had been set up in Virginia, and to be able to bring into the Washington Post, along with me, a guy named Raju Narasetti, who'd worked with me at the Wall Street Journal, who was strategic and incredibly effective on the digital side. So we were able to modernize a newsroom that was, I would say, not exactly in the spirit and operating at the speed and the cadence of the digital era. We did make a lot of changes that were initially um, hard to persuade people of the value of, putting up, as you say, putting up metrics, putting up uh, screens around the news and that showed how we were doing minute by minute um, against targets that we'd set for, for building audience and increasing engagement was not terribly popular at the time we did it. I mean, now, as you say, it's widely embraced. There were a lot of concerns in the traditional newsrooms in America at the time that we were doing that, that, you know, as people started, you know, chasing clicks, as they said, that um, it would lead traditional newsrooms to go down market in the kind of content that they produced, because it was obvious that you could get a lot more clicks with content that was perhaps a lot less serious, you know, people who, who wrote traditional journalism on subjects that were seen as dry or policy oriented were afraid, you know, they would, they would suddenly find themselves not getting resources or support from editors because, you know, other kinds of content would draw a lot more attention. I think that's not exactly how it's played out. um, Although I don't think it's completely wrong. You know, it used to be one of the criticisms you'd get if you ran a newsroom or a newspaper was, you know, certain, there was always somebody who would say that you were just publishing news of, you know, a murder, or something sensational, to, you know, to, to increase subscriptions or to increase newsstand sales. The truth of newspapers was, you know, until the internet really took over, we we were largely in the U.S. a subscription-oriented business, and whether we ran pictures on the front page of the Washington Post of an FCC policy deliberation or we ran pictures of you know, naked streakers on the mall, the same number of newspapers would land in the same number of driveways in the morning. And there might be some, you know, additional newsstand sales, but a negligible amount. But as as newspapers, as newsrooms rather, uh, started focusing much more on digital engagement and audience, and those metrics became important, they began to operate undoubtedly a little bit more like television newsrooms had always done, where they knew, you know, in television people always knew what the ratings were the night before and they knew what had worked. And and in in fact, there's substantial evidence that, you know, the pressure to increase audience and to give the audiences what they want, I think it did lead to a diminution of the quality of uh, television news in in a lot of American markets, including the national news. You know, and I think in, in, in newsrooms today in America, 
in the last, we've seen this in the last four or five years with political coverage. You know, it was clear that if you if you ran lots of stories about Donald Trump, it drove a lot of traffic. And I think there was probably a kind of self-reinforcing cycle um, that was driven by the knowledge that if you publish certain kinds of information, it delivers certain kinds of audience engagement. Yeah, and on the flip side, for for readers, it gives a greater level of control if you have the newspaper because you get to pick and choose what you solely get to pick and choose what you want to read. But with the algorithms driving it stuff to you that you're interested in, right? The the algorithm knows what you're going towards, and it gives you more of that. So you also see on the flip side the risks of that as well in terms of your ability to consume the you know the kind of news all all levels of news and you you see that with all of the disinformation going on now that youtube will look at some of your search words and it'll start to send you down this rabbit hole of disinformation yeah i mean it's deeply unfortunate the impact of algorithms on on well two things first on the serendipity factor you know it is true that one of the joys of reading a newspaper is you, when you turn the page, you never know what you're going to encounter there. And you could say the same thing to some degree is true if you like switch on Twitter and you start going through Twitter. But the reality is even on something like Twitter, there's there, there are powerful algorithms that are trying to design a feed for you that will keep you engaged and give you content that the algorithm knows you like. Now, the, the ugly truth of the ugly, not widely discussed truth of Silicon Valley is their products are actually pretty lousy. The, the algorithms don't actually do a spectacularly good job at giving you the range of content that you might like. It's not that they're not trying, but they don't work. I mean, there's been tons written on, on how YouTube drives people into cul-de-sacs of, of hate speech and extremist content because somebody watched one piece of content that the algorithm somehow interpreted as meaning that you're interested in you know one kind of content. And you can see, if you want to see algorithms at work, I mean, one of the one of the things that's fun to do is go on TikTok and don't register and just use TikTok over a period of time and watch how the TikTok algorithm cycles different kinds of content past you to see what you like and what you watch. It's trying to figure out what, what you like, and then it'll send you different channels of content. I mean, these algorithms, they're, they're still pretty rudimentary. They don't, they don't really give you the range of content and the experience and the knowledge you would get if you if you actually just from a news point of view, if you just sat down and read a newspaper, because they're designed to give you more of what they think you like, and therefore they're not likely to find the things that you don't know that you like. And I remember once going to Facebook when they were they were building out a Facebook news feed, and I talked to the the guy who was then in charge of Facebook News, and he he was telling me about how great their algorithms were, and you know they knew what I liked, they would know what my friends liked. They could tell me exactly what kind of content you know I would be interested in at any given moment. It happened to be the day that I went to see him. I think it was the afternoon of, or maybe it was the day after, a meteor had come down in Siberia and caused this, you know, kind of scary and shocking uh, streak across the sky and then sort of loud explosion when it it hit the earth where it hit the earth and, you know, cars, car windows were rattled and, you know, windows were broken and buildings and people were thrown off their feet. And there were tons of dashboard can videos from Siberia showing this thing. It was kind of spectacular and a little bit frightening. And I said to the guy, you could have all, you know, all the algorithms in the world won't tell you that the minute that thing happens, all anybody wants to do is read about like, how likely is it the earth is going to be destroyed by a meteor, <laughs> you know, and all anybody's going to want to watch is these videos. And of course, the algorithms will pick it up pretty fast. They'll figure out within an hour that like that that they're that everybody's watching this stuff and then they'll they'll pick it up. But you know, it isn't able to identify the new thing. It isn't able to know what you don't it doesn't know what it doesn't know, but it you know, and a, but a human editor could have, could have told you in, in immediately instantaneously. I mean, the minute I saw that happen, I I knew that all anybody would want to read about that day was that. Yeah, I remember that actually, the videos, and it was crazy and, and amazing, right? It's funny, I've been a longtime newspaper reader at the paper form, and only about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, I switched to digital, and I'm acutely aware all the time, you know, am I reading everything there is out there, or is the algorithm that's just sending stuff my way? Uh, so definitely something to think about. Let's just take the newspaper, for example. I could, I could consume hours talking about what I think is wrong with Silicon Valley, but like if you take a digital newspaper, you know, if you were a reader of the New York Times, 
as I was, and I'll grant you that I may have been a somewhat abnormal or unusual reader, I would tend to read newspapers cover to cover. I would sit down with you know three or four newspapers in the morning, start reading at the beginning, and finish reading at the end, and I'd read pretty much everything in between. And you know, I was familiar with sports, I was familiar with culture, I was familiar with business, I knew what was going on in you know food trends, what restaurants were happening. You could you could get a lot of information out of a newspaper if you go to the New York Times website, and you just start going through the New York Times website, there's tons of New York Times content every day you will not find. You may find, you know, six articles relating to, you know, Joe Biden issuing executive orders to control guns in some way, because that's the news of the day. And, and they're very quick to put stuff up because they know they have to, you know, surf those, those waves of interest. But you'll never navigate your way through to certain kinds of content. And so, if you are somebody who's very interested in the arts, you may start reading the New York Times through its art section and never navigate your way through the sports section. So people's information diets, I think, are becoming more siloed. And the internet has made it possible for people to have more information, more authoritative information, faster information than they could ever have before. And in some ways, it's good, right? You know, there's I've heard a lot of I've heard a lot of people bemoan uh, the end of the, the traditional era of foreign correspondence where you know one correspondent for the chicago tribune based in beijing would you know travel asia and write these great feature stories for readers of chicago who you know needed to know about what was going on in asia a little bit but probably not very much and you know there's a lot of people who especially in traditional journalism who who worry about the end of that kind of foreign correspondence i'm not particularly worried about it because the truth is, you know, and I knew those correspondents who worked for the Chicago Tribune, or in my case, the Wall Street Journal, and, you know, they would fly into a place they might not go, but once a year, they would get into a taxi, talk to the driver about what was going on, go to the hotel, read the newspapers, make a few phone calls to people they talked to the last time they were there and write a story saying what was happening in Indonesia, say. Whereas today, you know, if you actually care about Indonesia, as opposed to the bulk of the readers who might read the story because they're kind of curious, you know, what the Wall Street Journal thinks is important on in, about Indonesia or the Washington Post. You know, if you actually care deeply about it, especially if you happen to be expert um, and you're, let's say you're living in Washington and you're, you know, part of the World Bank's team that decides whether to allocate resources to the development of Indonesia, and you maybe even speak Bahasa, you can wake up in the morning, you can know everything that somebody in Jakarta knows about what's going on in Indonesia. So the quality and the depth of information for people who care deeply about things is, is widely available. The hazard of the era we live in, of course, is that, you know, people generally are not all communicating on the same set of information. They don't operate on the same facts anymore because, you know, different sources produce different uh, frames of understanding the world around us. And there's not a sort of general, the number of people who have, let's say, general awareness of important things who have the information that allows them to make, you know, good decisions in democracies or good policy decisions about economics, the number of people who have sort of wide knowledge, I think is greatly diminished because people read vertically. They read what interests them. They get great information on the things that interest them. And they, they may be better informed than, than they've ever been on their hobbies or their professions, but they're not necessarily well educated on things horizontally. They don't know, they don't know what's going on broadly. They know what's going on vertically. Over your long career, you've, you've touched on basically virtually all aspects of media and news media, photography, writing, editing, design, digital, and, and obviously integrating digital into news media. What made you decide to go into investing in media companies and creating North-based media? When I left the Washington Post as editor, I went to work for Don Graham, who then owned the paper as an advisor and then Vice President of Graham Holdings Company, as it was, it was then called the Washington Post Company, but now it's Graham Holdings, on digital media strategy and investing. And it was a great perch from which to look at all the changes that were going on. I had I had lived the previous 12 years. Um, I'd been one of the top editors at the Wall Street Journal, and then I was the, I was the top editor in 2007 at the time News Corp acquired Dow Jones, and then I went to the Post and was editor there. And for those 12 years, you know, I was more or less perpetually engaged in adapting big traditional newsrooms to technological change, to workflow change, to, you know, audience behavior change. And there were 
you know, tons of things that were happening that were fascinating to me, um, a lot of which transcended the traditional news domain. In the old days of newspapers, for example, there was a circulation department that was, or a marketing department, they were combined. And the circulation and marketing department's basic mission was to decide what the audience that the newspaper needed should be, go out and market and make sure that circulation distribution was available in those areas and build audience in order for the ad department to be able to maximize sales of and revenues from advertising to those um, audiences. In the digital world, the audience is determined largely by the kind of content, the timing of the content, the manner in which you distribute content. And all of those things are the domain of, of news. Traditionally, the content producers who traditionally just they they just did content and somebody else worried about you know what the audience should be and how to sell the advertising in the digital world those things all converge and if you are if you are somebody sitting in a in a newsroom today making decisions about what content to distribute on what platform to what audiences at what time you're making decisions that fundamentally and without any exception affect the way the the business itself is run. You know, it, your decision about what content to distribute to what audience determines what kind of advertising you're going to get and what kind of revenues you're going to get, what kind of traffic you're going to get, what kind of engagement you're going to get. And so when I went to work for the Washington Post parent company and started looking at digital media, I realized it was time to broaden my understanding of how media worked well beyond content to every other aspect, to the business side, to the technology side, to understanding strategically where the industry was going to go. Um, we were increasingly, it was clear to me, going to be competing with businesses that traditionally were not considered uh, news businesses. On, in the digital world, we all coexist on what I call this vast, flat digital plane. We can all see what everybody else is doing. When somebody is reading an article from the Wall Street Journal on her iPhone, own. She's a click away from, you know, playing a game on her phone, from making a phone call, from texting a friend. And the experience of consuming content on a phone, on a tablet, on a laptop, increasingly is, is indistinguishable from a user point of view, whether you're consuming content from a traditional news provider, from a, from a television um, entertainment company, from game, from even from commerce companies, you know, it's the convergence of content. You mentioned this at the very beginning, the convergence of content and commerce is coming fast because, you know, if you think about, if you look at Amazon, for example, you know, Amazon's not a place you go shopping, right? If you, if in the old days, people might go shopping in a department store, look around, see what they might like and buy something, but you can't really go shopping in some, you know, Amazon website with, I don't know, a billion SKUs, different products that are available. You, you, there's no way to really conveniently navigate it. So Amazon is forced to, like everything with content, use algorithms to try and drive you to places it thinks you might want to go based on your past behavior. And that's not really shopping, but it may it may satisfy some need in you. But I think if, if you look at how content engages people, if a magazine publishes online you know, floral print dresses are in for spring and they publish a bunch of images of floral print dresses. Each one of those images is shoppable because you can click on it and it'll give you a range of floral print dresses you might be able to buy for different price points that might lead to a convergence of commerce and content where the content company might, might get, let's say, an affiliate fee, a, a commission for every sale that comes out of an image that they publish on their content site. And that that's happening. It's happening all the time now. Uh, and that's a much better experience from a consumer point of view, from a shopper's point of view, to be hearing from a content company you trust about like, here are some interesting floral print dresses you might want to consider for spring, as opposed to having, you know, H&M or Gucci tell you, hey, this is what we think you should be buying because everybody knows that they're pushing their products. Yeah. 
And it's fascinating. Even even the big, if you look at the New York Times and the Washington Post now, you know, that paid content on Wall Street Journal even, it's striking to see how much more prominent and interwoven that paid content is along with news articles. You know, you really have to sort of step back sometimes and say, wait a minute, I'm looking at, I'm actually looking at an ad. I'm not looking at an article. Uh, and I think that's both, uh, you know, it's, it's helpful in some ways, but also very risky, right? Because you sometimes may not know what you're reading and, and who's pushing, pushing the information. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's very important for content companies to preserve their integrity for people to know what they, what they are and what they stand for. Um, because, you know, in this ever deepening ocean of information of content, uh, images, words, videos, everything you can look at on your phone, your computer. I do think people are increasingly seeking out islands of clarity, things that they know that they can trust and rely on. And at some level, that's good. I think it's been very beneficial to traditional news publishers. I mean, if you look at the growth of digital subscribers to New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, it's driven, I think, in part because people feel like I need to know there's one place I can go and the the content they're delivering to me is reliable. It's, it's what I want to see. I think there's a danger in it that when I say people seek out oceans of clarity, um, I see, seek out islands of clarity in this ocean of information, there are unfortunately are also people who will decide that their island of clarity is the place that seems most resonant to them. And that may lead them to a place that's not a reliable source of information. And I think perhaps the, the gravest threat right now, not only to journalism and its credibility with people, but also to our society and particular democracies uh, is misinformation and disinformation. And I think a lot of it has been, you know, the accidental byproduct of technological changes. You know, technology, I, mean, obviously I don't think anybody in, in technology set out to erode democracy, though I think their products have, have done terrible damage. And they've done it, you know, it started, I think, with social media making it very easy to share information. And it suddenly seemed to people that what journalism was doing was like no different than what they were doing. I can share that something on Facebook and, you know, my 300 closest friends see it and comment on it. There's a fire in my neighborhood and I take a picture and post it on Twitter and people all respond to it. It feels like, you know, this journalism thing's not that hard, you know, getting information and, and distributing it. And then you know, the next thing that happened was technologies made it really easy to make all content look the same. So if your email inbox in the morning contains an email newsletter from CNN alongside an email newsletter from InfoWars, they look the same. And you might say, well, you know, what makes this one right and this one wrong? And people start choosing the ones that they think are more resonant. And next thing that happens is, you know, this, this uh, AI algorithm machinery that we were talking about before, which directs people into the sort of these, these cul-de-sacs of like-minded people, so-called filter bubbles. You know, once you say you're interested in certain kinds of content, you signal to the algorithm, this is what you like, it, it feeds you more of that. And all of a sudden, you're seeing all this information that looks like journalism, that seems to have been gathered in the same way, and happens to coincide with your worldview. And so you think, ah, this is something I can rely on. Why shouldn't I believe this? Why should I believe this other stuff? And then on top of everything else, the, the big platforms have these powerful economic incentives for feeding you more content that may be false, even if it's reassuring to your worldview, because they know that you engage with it more. And their incentives are, because they're driven by advertising, by clicks, their incentives are to to have you engage more. And there's been a lot of reporting that's been quite powerful and disappointing from the point of view of how the institutions behaved about Facebook and how Facebook, you know, knowingly, Facebook executives knowingly allowed content they knew to be, you know, false or misleading or inflammatory to be distributed on its platform because it was engaging. And, you know, I think that was a sort of a bit of a moral abdication on the part of Facebook. I think there's been a lot of moral abdication on the part of big companies in Silicon Valley because they're a little bit misguided by uh, naive and ill thought out philosophies of, of libertarianism that don't actually reflect what's good for the society democracy that allows them to even have those philosophies. But you know, it's what it is. 
So what's the solution? What are you seeing that might offset some of these dangerous trends? Well, you know, the, the easy answer is it would be really helpful if some of the powerful people in Silicon Valley grew up and got a conscience and, and a sense of responsibility. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, let's say, almost greed-driven childlike thinking among executives in Silicon Valley who've rationalized behavior that's at best amoral. And they say things about what they can allow and not allow and what they can accommodate and not accommodate. And they invoke the First Amendment and they say, you know, they have to take all sides into account. And there's all kinds of rationalizations, but they, they're really, they come down to, like, you can't, there are, these, are, these are not unsolvable problems. There are technologies that they themselves have built that would allow them to begin to grapple with some of the things like, you know, false and misinformation that whether it's on, on COVID or encouraging hate, hate speech in certain countries and different languages, you know, they could deal with it. It would require, in the case of the big technology companies, it would require that their profit margins go down. It's not that they couldn't address these problems. It might mean there would be less engagement. It might mean that they would spend a lot more money on content moderation and on tools to keep certain kinds of information out. It would mean they would have to make choices that would require them to be perhaps smaller and less profitable. Maybe their gross profit margins go from 60% or 70% to 20% or 30%. But that might be the price of being a responsible corporate citizen and, and participant in a, in a world where these kinds of misinformation and disinformation are potentially fatal to and at minimum toxic to democracies. And democracies are essential for the existence of these kinds of companies. It's worth saying that, you know, the company that I think is probably most culpable in this area is, is Facebook. And Facebook today reaches more people if you aggregate the audience of Instagram, Facebook, and WhatsApp, all of which are owned by Facebook. They reach more people in aggregate every day than or every month than were alive on this earth the day Mark Zuckerberg was born. And when, when Facebook went public, Mark Zuckerberg followed the example of, I should say, some, some big newspaper groups and created a two-tier shareholder structure where he controls the voting power in Facebook. And so he has supermajority control over Facebook. He's, he's held all the responsibility for the Facebook. He's, he's, you know, he's kept not all of the economics of Facebook, he just, he allowed that to be made public more, but he kept all the responsibility for Facebook, which the publishers of newspapers, when, when they went public, you know, more than a generation ago in the 1960s and 70s, they used the similar two-tier shareholder structure, which I think actually probably should be legal, but that's a whole separate conversation. They wanted a two-tier shareholder structure because they needed to preserve the editorial integrity of newspapers and not subject them to commercial pressures. I think it's interesting what's happened with Facebook is, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has this super control over the company. He's retained the responsibility, but at the same time, he's rejecting responsibility. You know, he creates, they create a, a Supreme Court, a super governance body to oversee the editorial decisions of Facebook, which frankly, I think, you know, when you keep your, you keep the super voting control of the company, that's one of the responsibilities you should be taking not trying to outsource it to somebody else so you're not actually responsible for the thing that you've insisted on keeping responsibility for. Um, you know, it's, again, I don't, I don't have a problem with this, organ this body being created, <clears throat> except insofar as I don't think you need somebody else to make those decisions for you. I think those are hard, difficult decisions. There may be too many of them to, for you to make all at once, but I think ultimately they can't, you can't set up a separate decision-making body for that. You have to take responsibility for what you're doing. And, in taking responsibility for what you're doing, you have to confront some of the moral consequences of the product you build. And when Facebook says for, for months and years that there are certain things they can't do, they can't, just, they can't control certain kinds of content, you know, they can try to control it at the margins. And then a few weeks before the election, all of a sudden they say, well, actually, we're going to take down all the QAnon content. Or they say, you know, we're going to suspend political advertising for a period of time. It's like the, it's, it reminds me of the old joke about Winston Churchill sitting next to Lady Astor and he asks her, you know, would you sleep with me for a million pounds? And she says, 
uh, well, I suppose I might. And he says, well, how about for 100? And she says, what do you take me for? And he says, we've established that we're now negotiating, we're just haggling over the price. And, you know, that's what Facebook basically, you know, it said they actually can do this stuff, but they choose not to. So looking ahead and wrapping up to the next year or two years or five years, what do you think will happen to potentially rein in companies like Facebook? What do you think will happen? There's a whole lot of different pressures that are arising. You know, at the end of the day, Google and Facebook should be treated like utilities. Um, and utilities are largely regulated. We've never had a situation where, you know, one individual has such control over information globally. We've had, we have tools for dealing with economic monopoly, which there's no question Facebook and Google uh, are, are in the monopoly camp. And there are, there are tools for addressing their economic monopoly. We don't have tools or even a comfortable pathway in the United States for addressing information monopoly because you know, the First Amendment basically precludes that. And therefore, you know, we're gonna to have to think as a society, like how do, we, how do we pressure these companies to do the right thing? How do we get them to recognize that you know, maintaining their profit margins at the expense of our democratic societies may be a mistake, that they should, they should take another path? How do we put economic pressure on them so they, they don't continue to do this? Now, there, it's gonna come from individual countries I expect, you know, the Europeans are obviously well ahead of the Americans in terms of their concern over privacy regulations. I'm not sure GDPR was the smoothest solution ever, but, you know, they're addressing it and they're very focused on, on issues of like what kind of content can be distributed. Individual countries are going to restrict what content can be distributed. Um, some countries are going to, you know, start requiring that the big technology platforms actually pay fair compensation for the information that they that they profit from, you know, all these, both Facebook and Google and Twitter, all these companies are, you know, they rely heavily on other pe content other people create for them, whether it's people just posting about their friends or sharing newspaper articles or, you know, videos. Other people pay for the content creation that these platforms then monetize. And, you know, they're, the platforms rather disingenuously say, oh, well, you know, it's a fair trade because we're giving them the distribution and the tools to reach all these people. But if it was really a fair trade, their profit margins wouldn't be as fat as they are. A fair trade would suggest much, much narrower profit margins. I think that the, so I think it's going to be country by country regulation. You know, a lot of countries in the world, I think, look at how China regulates its internet. And I don't want to hold China up as a, as a model for anything, because I think the, a lot of what, <laughs> what China is doing in the world right now is terrible and, and problematic to democracy. And and free movement of people and information. But you know what, what China does is China says to the internet companies, look, there's a st certain stuff you can't do. And we're gonna leave it to you to figure out you know, how to deal with it, but here's what you can't do. And they, and they say, you know, don't publish information about, for example, Beijing's repression of the Uyghurs. Don't publish information about Beijing's repression of Hong Kong. Don't publish information that would seem to flatter Taiwan. Publish don't publish information that would seem to make the US look good. You know, they and they they basically issue these edicts, and then the internet companies are in a position of having to figure out how to implement these edicts, and the government doesn't go beyond that. Now, I don't think the U.S. again is ever going to go down that path, and I'm glad I'm glad that it won't. But I think there are a lot of other countries in the world that will, and they'll just say, you know, hey, Facebook, if you want to operate here, here's the rules. If you Google, if you want to if you want to operate here, here are the rules. And some companies may, you know, when confronted with um, those kinds of requests, may make difficult decisions as as Google once famously did when it pulled out of China after China hacked into some Chinese people's accounts on on Gmail Google basically said we're out of here and and stepped out of China in, in a big way for a long time um, you know Facebook recently encountered this in Australia when Australia insisted that internet companies that want to redistribute content pub, you know produced by news companies in Australia who paid to have that content, who paid for the cost, paid the cost of having that content created. If they want to redistribute that content, they're going to have to pay the publishers for it. Facebook, in one of the all-time insane sort of policy responses I've ever seen a company launch, decided that they were going to just stop allowing the distribution of news and other related content, including, by the way, a lot of nonprofit content, including from foundations and organizations that were trying to provide information about how to get, you know, COVID vaccines or be safe in COVID, 
Facebook just suspended all that information and demonstrated it's sort of, you know, it's bullying behavior in the worst form. In the end, Australia and Facebook reached an accommodation. Facebook agreed to pay publishers for information, which, as many commentators pointed out, seemed to favor Rupert Murdoch, who was not considered by everybody to be exactly the little guy that they want to see, you know, Facebook helping in this world, but it got, it solved Facebook's problem in Australia. Interesting. Well, Marcus, thanks so much for joining me today and for the great conversation. It's a pleasure, Chitra. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. I appreciate it. Marcus Broccoli is co-founder of North Base Media, an investment firm specializing in media and technology in global growth markets. Broccoli has served as an advisor to media groups, including Graham Holdings, Univision, and HT Media. Before co-founding North Base Media, Broccoli was executive editor of the Washington Post, overseeing the Post's print and digital news operations, shepherding the storied newspaper's sweeping digital revolution, which began on his watch. And during his tenure, the Post won seven Pulitzer Prizes. Before joining the Post, Broccoli was managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. His tenure at the Journal included 15 years as a foreign correspondent, mainly in Asia, and eight years as a senior editor in New York. This is Techtopia. I'm Chitra Raghavan. Techtopia is a podcast from Good Story, an advisory firm helping technology startups with brand strategy, positioning, and narrative. Our producer is Jeremy Kaur, founder and CEO of Executive Podcasting Solutions, with production assistance from Kate Cruz. Our creative advisor is Adi Weinland, and our research and logistics lead is Sarah Muller. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. And if you like the show, please rate it five stars, leave a review, and do recommend it to your friends, family, and colleagues. For questions, comments, and transcripts, please visit our website at goodstory.io or send us an email at podcast at goodstory.io. Join us next week for another episode of Techtopia. I'll see you then.